Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. So today we have our EIA show because it flipped. We did econ yesterday, EIA today, due to when the New Year's holiday was recognized, which was Monday, which delays EIA data until Thursday. So we, we have a lot to go through. Some of the charts might be slightly difficult to read right now, especially the Singapore ones, just because it's the new year and there's only one data point. So it's a little point, but I'll try to d describe it and walk through what those numbers are and give some context into where we think they're going to go. So in the in the first segment, we're going to look at U.S. storage, uh, you know, how it closed out because really 2022 matched 2021. And we want to look at what does that mean going forward? Is there anything big in terms of where that could end up? And then we want to look at that global floating storage that we've been talking about because we expected to see the spike. We got it. And now what happens next? Then in segment two, we're going to talk about U.S. demand, which fell flat. A lot of that was driven based on weather impacts. There was a huge amount of different storms. As we saw, there was a huge uh, shutdown of refining capacity in pad three due to the cold. We're going to go through what that what does that mean? How did that drive the draws out of gasoline and distillate? And then we're in the last segment, we're going to talk about the Saudi uh, OSP cuts. They cut into Asia and Europe, not into the U.S. What does that uh, look like? And so far, differentials have remained fairly stable. Uh, we've had some cuts, some increases. So we want to go through what does that look like as we head into January? So now when we uh, kick off as how we closed last uh, last year, here you can see that uh, the deficit widened from 10.6 to 18.5, but when you look at it in realistically, it's it's right in the in the range. It's just below the average from 2017 to 2019. So again, very much normal when you look at the total oil and products. When you look at land and floating storage, the deficit narrowed from 21.4 to 2.6. It's just slightly above the average from 17 to 19. A lot of that is driven based on floating storage because there's still is uh, less on the land side. And then when you look at total oil product stockpiles, the fl uh, we flip back to a deficit. We went from a surplus of 10.8 to a deficit of 15.9, but you can see it's right in the comfort level of that 2017-19 level. So really nothing too crazy one way or the other and fairly in line with where things were as of uh, what what were what's called normal periods of 17 to 19. And just, again, uh, accounting for COVID being the abnormal. Now, one little uh, hiccup that we had here, uh, this uh, just recent, just today, the Colonial uh, shut a uh, the line three. Uh, which is going to impact some flows when you look at the connections coming up. Colonial Pipeline halted the uh, operations, and it's coming up through Virginia at this point because there was a spill in Virginia, so they had to shut it down. They uh, the, Right now, they're planning a restart for 12 p.m. on Saturday. So for those keeping track at home, today is Thursday. So we'll get a little bit of a hiccup. It, it's not huge. You know, it's not like when they had a shutdown because they were hacked and it was weeks. This is something that is going to be more of just a short term uh, issue. And but at the same time, when you when we go through gasoline and distillate draws from pad three and a lot of that is driven because you had a big shutdown in refining capacity that that then causes refiners to pull from storage. So that will will then correct itself. This will just leave a little bit more in storage just because they they have to slow down what's coming up and again just getting things back to normal land storage as you can see here the deficit widened from 46.4 to 47.8 uh, it's well below the range and average when you look at it from that perspective and again a lot of this is driven based on uh, the increase in distance the amount of crude on the water versus in pipe and that's where you're seeing this disconnect that remains between land and floating because there is that crude that is in the water. That's why we, we like to look at them together and separately so we can give that clean picture of where things sit right now. West of Suez, the deficit narrowed from 31 to 30, uh, just right in line with where we were in 20, excuse me, 2021. And then east of Suez, deficit narrowed from 13.2 to 12.3. And that's just at the very low end of that cloud, but well above where we were in 2021. And we should see more of that as, as uh, China has continued to import. 
We've seen a drop in the amount of tankers heading into the country, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to keep coming just because there is a lot behind it based on what we've seen so far. And then floating storage uh, surplus widened from 12.9 to 33.9. This is what we were talking about with that with that disconnect between floating storage and transit. We had a, a big slug of crude go into transit, which then fell out of floating storage. And now it is starting to find its home and, and uh, sitting offshore. So that has resulted in a spike in floating storage. West of Suez, we went from uh, a deficit of 2.4 to a surplus of 6.6. A lot of that is driven based on the ad valorem tax, you know, with in, as we come into the end of the year, U.S. tries to keep it offshore. West Africa had some uh, some builds. Europe had some big builds. So, again, that has created some of these increases. And then east of Suez, surplus widened from 18 to 27.8. And a lot of that, again, was driven by Asia. So before we go further, uh, we just wanted to touch on where crude prices are right now. You know, we think that crude prices are obviously going to be volatile, but there's it's going to be volatile, volatile within a range. You know, realistically, Brent should go between 78 and 82 with some extensions to the downside at 76, uh, then really extensions to 84. You know, the problem right now is there's the two pieces to it. You have the macro side where you clearly have a macro problem with a recession there, manufacturing slowing, uh, global manufacturing in a recession, as we discussed yesterday in the econ show. But then you have the supply problem where you have Russia that can't go west. They're going east. A lot of that is increasing distance. You have you have OPEC that is still producing well below their quotas. So again, there's even though we're seeing that demand slow down, we also have that supply problem, which is where we get this kind of range bound move. And it's really going to matter on what is driving the narrative that day. Is it the supply shortage because OPEC is below quotas? Is it the slowdown in in economic activity? And that's why we're, we see this kind of range. But if, if OPEC was producing where it was supposed to produce, if supply was where it was supposed to be, and we had this economic backdrop, realistically, we should be in the 60s. But we're not. And based, and that's why there's that 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 let's just call it that fight back and forth between where is crude now, where, uh, where is crude demand now, where is it going, and then where is that supply? And the supply is what is helping keep us elevated, even though the economic backdrop is uh, is waning. Then obviously you have China, where China is in their reopening uh, phase. But as we all know, it is, <laughs> it's a little lumpy when you're reopening an economy, especially when you have this massive infection rate, which is keeping consumers at bay. And that's something that we're going to talk about more in segment two, as well as segment three, because we do think that's going to provide a bump in February, you know, end of January into February, but they've increased export quotas. So now you have a big slug of export quotas coming out. But what does that, so as, as China exports more product, it's going to diminish, uh, it's going to hurt uh, crack spreads in Asia, which is going to reduce economic, uh, which is going to reduce runs. All at the same time, and as China's ramping, you have a lot of other countries in Asia and emerging markets which are seeing a slowdown. So again, you kind of get that balancing act, all of which, again, keeps you range bound. But depending on what is driving the narrative that day is going to keep things volatile and, again, keeping things in this range. When we look at the U.S., uh, crude oil had a build of 1.69 uh, million. Uh, when you factor in the SPR, it was a draw of 1.05. You know, it was fairly stable. Pad 3 had a build of 2.28. A lot of that was just because, again, refiners came down. As refiners came down, more crude was left in storage. Everything else was was kind of pretty stable. Uh, Pad 2 had a small build of 420,000. Cushing, small build of 240,000. They remain the key drivers of the shortage within the U.S. Because Pad 3, again, well above uh, the the year over year, well above the five year. Same can be said for again pad four, pad five, as well as pad one. Fairly stable. And then when you look at the whole the whole approach in terms of the different basis, uh, when in general you can say you can see that the year over year change is up two point eight uh, million. So what with the but 
below the five year by 40 million. So again, there's just the balancing act of what, what metric matters most. Everyone has a differing opinion. I just try to give you all the different data so you understand where things are. I would say that the year over year matters more in terms of where we are, where we're going, and especially when you look at the economic backdrop, not only in the US, but on the OECD level, as well as the emerging uh, world. Production bounced. You know, we, we closed out the year close to about 12.3 million you know, fairly in line with what we were saying with uh, some extensions, what we believe to, to the upside. Uh, CPC continued to see uh, an increase in flows, and we're going to talk more about that in segment three. Uh, just putting into perspective on pad three, you can see that we closed above uh, 2021 and the only two years that were higher were 2016 and 2020. So again, very comfortable from a pad three level. Uh, Cushing uh, came in uh, came in flat. You know, that was something that we thought was going to continue to go, <clears throat> excuse me, grind higher. Uh, again, not by a huge number, but something closer to where we were. But as we were saying before, with the shutdown of Keystone, that impacted flows. As that started to normalize, we should start to see additional builds. But you can see that we closed the uh, the year at a fairly bullish side of the on the low end of storage. Runs, huge hit. Uh, down 12.4%, went from 92% op- utilization rates to 796 Some of that was driven by seasonality, but most of it was driven by weather. Uh, you had pad three that shut 1.6, uh, essentially 1.67 uh, 7, 1.7 million uh, barrels a day of throughput. Pad two shut 505,000 barrels a day. You can see that that is well below the five year. You got a huge uh, uh, drop out. But again, now we see that bounce coming back up. And and it should just normalize and, and just move back to where we were seasonally speaking. And for those that have been here for URI, for uh, you know different hurricanes and other types of weather events, the snapback is usually quick as long as there isn't damage. And because this was a freeze off, you shut things down to protect your assets instead of hurricanes where you have to come in do your your checks to make sure everything's safe. This is something that is a little bit easier. Again, not to say that you have, you have to make sure that pipes didn't crack, things didn't uh, get uh, impeded by the um, by the winter weather. But again, that is something that is fairly stable. So we should see that bounce back very quickly. Now here's just put into context on that drop, and and you can see that we were tracking fairly normal. Uh, we'll well it'll come back. The question is going to be be based on where crack spreads are. Do they start taking their run cuts, economic, uh, turnarounds a little bit sooner? Not to say that they'll do it in January, but a lot of them are always planning for Feb, early March. Do you start to see that creep forward just because they're not making the money that they would like, given where distillate cracks are right now? Imports dropped 540,000 barrels. Uh, Pad 2 had a drop of 578,000. You know, it's get again bouncing back and forth. A lot of that is seasonal. Pad two at a drop of two hundred twenty four thousand. That will bounce back now that we're in the new year. Ad valorem tax is is Dece- uh, December 20, uh, 2023's problem, so they'll get back to normal. And then pad five had a bounce, but again that is lumpy, so we should see that drop down. So realistically, we should see an increase in pad two and pad three imports as we go into next week. And this just gives you an idea on that closeout. Typically, we close at the lows when you look at uh, December. Here, you can see that it was impacted not only by the imports that were going out, because remember, some of these direction, some of these waterways have one ways only. Imports were up big. Uh, exports were up big. So then imports were down. And why wouldn't they be down? Maximize your exports, get it off the coast, and then minimize your imports to, uh, to try to minimize your tax bill at the end of the year. Pad two, you can see, took out the lows. We should see a, a fairly sizable snapback uh, this week into next week. And a lot of that, again, is driven based on the recovery of Keystone and some additional normalcies coming through. <clears throat> Implied demand took a huge hit. Uh, that, that was expected just given we always get a big spike going into, obviously, uh, win, uh, Christmas. People are traveling for Christmas, a lot of activity. <clears throat> but then during that period, not only do you have people that are now with their families, they're not going to drive as much. You also had major snowstorms, blizzards coming through, inclement weather on multiple levels, whether it be freeze-offs as well as snow which impacted where uh, where demand was. That will bounce back, but it's not going to bounce back to nine. Uh, nine million barrels a day, it'll probably be something closer to 8.4, 8.5. 
Distillate had a huge drop of over a million barrels. And again, that's something a bit more seasonal. Uh, that now we have a, a bit of a warm up when you look at throughout the whole U.S. So that's going to keep distillate, or I should say, um, heating oil demand lower, just because you, a lot of guys rip through uh, products. So we should see a bit of a bounce, just because you'll have to refill what you burn through with when your family was in your home, trying to keep everyone warm during those uh, those cold days. But that will, again, uh, normalize a bit. And then we did get a small bounce in trucking, but nothing meaningful. So we'll still be well below average, but again, just moving into a a fairly um, stable move at about 3.2 million barrels a day. Jet right around where we've been saying it's going to be 1.45, 1.55, nothing major there. And then propane, propylene uh, had a drop of 547,000. That's going to remain a bit depressed now that we have a bit of the warm up. We might get a a quick refill just because of what uh, people work through during the holiday season. But that will remain depressed, especially given where um, where margins are when we look at uh, the uh, the pet chem side. Implied uh, cru- uh, gasoline demand took out the 2020, uh, the the 2022, the 2020 lows. Again, <clears throat> not too surprising because every time there's a weather event, you always have the steep drop. You can see that we had that spike to about 9.3. It was still below uh, some of the normal spots, but again, when we look at the uh, the averages, you'll get an idea of just where we sit, and then we think that we're gonna we're gonna hang uh, closer to about 13. <coughs> excuse me, 13.8 to 14 million barrels a day when we look at, again, gasoline, uh, uh, distillate, um, uh, resid, as well as jet. Now, when we look at crude oil, excluding SPR, again, right in line with where we were in 2021. So still on the lower end versus the last couple of years, but you can see that things have been fairly stable at this point. Then when you look at uh, factoring in oil storage and products, we close right around where we were in 2020, uh, 2021. Again, just what we were expecting, just kind of holding flat. And we think that this is going to creep a bit higher now, just because in January, we should see some sizable builds driven by oil and gasoline as distillate continues to be in a fairly bullish spot in regards to storage. Now, when you look at days of supply, fairly stable you know this this will spike up because this doesn't car- this isn't capturing the big loss of uh, refined capacity so we'll get a bit of a mar- uh, markup next week and here you can see gasoline storage uh, closed out the year fairly flat and a lot of that was driven by weather just because you had some some big draws coming out of pad 2 and that's something where uh, I'm sorry, pad three caused by the uh, the, the cold snap with that with refining uh, getting shut down. But January is going is usually a big build uh, period, so we believe that as we go into January, we're going to kind of match those big builds and cap out pretty close to where we were uh, in 2021. <clears throat> Distillate closed out uh, r- right around where we were in 20 uh, at this uh, low end. You know, we don't see this as being too much uh, off pace at this point. When you look at the low side, you know, we think it's going to con- storage is going to continue to be in a bullish spot on a storage level just because there's a lot of demand that remains in the market, the margins are better abroad. So we'll continue to see pad three exporting and pad one is going to continue to struggle to bring in additional capacity. The warm up that we're seeing in the US is going to help just because it'll reduce heating uh, oil demand. But again, those are things that we'll fo- we'll keep uh, track on. Jet, you have to refill. So you have that drop in storage. You'll refill the uh, airports and things have, are still below where they were in 2019. And we don't see that changing in the near term. <clears throat> Here you can see that Contango has um, has gotten uh, steeper. Uh, and, and that's something that we think is going to be the case in the near term, just because there's going to remain some pressure in the front month as things do look a bit better as we get into Q2. So store now, sell more into Q2 just because, and, and if you think about it in Q1 and Q4, you had a lot of uh, slowdown and activity and now Q2, you're going to get a bit of that bump. And that's where we think there will be a, a nice little reprieve. And then if you look at the curve going out, you can see it's gotten a bit better than where it was in October and uh, and and early, uh, what is that green one? In early, de- uh, late December. So again, those are things that we expect to uh, to remain the case. 
Now, when you look at uh, floating storage in, uh, in, in the Gulf, you can see that we closed out pretty close to the 2022 highs. Now, we expect that to reverse with some of the exports coming down, imports increasing, and obviously the end of the tax season helps. So that's what we have for you on the holistic side. In the next segment, we're going to go deeper into U.S. product demand and where things are setting up for 2023. 